Today is Tuesday, November 15th, 2022. It is 6.02 p.m. This is the Ways and Means Committee of the Greenfield City Council. I'd like to uh, state the following as I call the meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded by the Ways and Means Committee. If any other persons present are doing the same, you must notify the chairperson at this time in accordance with MGL chapter 30A section 20G, no person shall address a meeting of a public body without permission of the chair and all persons shall at the request of the chair be silent. No person shall disrupt the proceedings of a meeting of a public body. If after clear warning from the chair, a person continues to disrupt the proceedings, the chair may order the person to withdraw from the meeting and if the person does not withdraw, the chair may authorize a constable or other officer to remove the person from the meeting. We'll go on to our roll call. Uh, call. Uh, Councillor DeSorga. Here. Councillor Healy. Here. Councillor Gola. Here. <clears throat> Councillor Taranzo. Here. And I am Councillor Forgy. We are all here. We have a full complement this evening. Um, there is no minutes that we need to approve. There is no public hearing, so we'll get right to the motions. The first item on our agenda uh, is to appropriate $600,000 from free cash to reduce the fiscal year 2023 tax rate. Um, this has been accompanied uh, by a letter from Liz Gilman explaining uh, why we need to do this. Are there any questions at all about the appropriation of this money? Okay, going to ask, I hear nobody um, has any questions or comments. So I'm, all, I'm going to ask for a recommendation uh, Every, is everyone in favor? Everyone in favor of making a positive recommendation, uh, please indicate by saying aye, raising your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we will move along. Our next item on the agenda is uh, to welcome our assessors this evening. Um, we have to, by law, get a tax classification in place. So um, we received some information from our assessors. I want to welcome them this evening. I am interested in having a brief um, overview of what is going to happen, what should be happening. If you have any questions in regard to uh, residential factors, um, small commercial exemptions, any of those things, there was a very nice document that was set along in our agenda that explained everything extremely well. But without further ado, um, I would like to call on our chief assessor, uh, Randall Austin, to start us off unless he would like the elected assessors to do so. Randy, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> I yes I can. I have hit that unmute button a few times. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry, we all struggle with that. <laughs> I haven't met you yet, but it's a pleasure and welcome to our meeting this evening. And we'd love to hear uh, what the assessors have to say in regard to our tax classification. Well, um, you know, along with the, the handout that we sent, um, you know, I'm not sure if you want to uh, make me the host, I could share the, the, the uh, document for everyone to see. Yes, we could do that. If I can figure, wait a minute, I have to figure it out. So don't, okay. don't go away. Okay. I can do it. Okay, thanks, Sheila. <laughs> Yeah, you just keep the counselors in line. I'll do this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, you should be all set now.
How's that? There you go. Yeah. That looks great. That looks very good. Okay, so yeah, here's uh, information. This is provided to us. Um, well, you know, for us, and we worked with our RG, our consulting group, and they provided some of the, you know, um, basic information, the introduction of really the steps in the setting of the tax rate process. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've been going through that and, and trying to get all the numbers and figures together. We had, uh, you know, an estimate, but things change, you know, up till the last second. We're we're <clears throat> right now in the process and I've been going back and forth with our Department of Revenue representative to get our initial information approved. So we have the LA3, which is our sales data. And then um, along with that goes the LA4 uh, valuation information and LA13 growth and LA15. So all the LAs that we have to get in basically um, trying to get that done so that we'll be able to vote tomorrow. We did get approval on our LA3 sales information uh, late today, and um, we're working on answering questions and submitting information regarding the, uh, the, the final approval. <clears throat> so there is some good information here about the, the tax levy, and that's basically the amount that we're going to be um, raising I noticed because I was just in gateway looking that this figure has actually changed a little bit and so um, you know the the levy is the amount that we're going to raise through taxes uh, the ceiling is the, the, the total amount that we can uh, raise you know there's new growth and then our levy limit which is the maximum amount that we would be able to uh, to to tax and um, you know, right now where we're at, the excess levy capacity is the amount over that. So that's great that we're not uh, tapped out as far as, you know, we still have some excess levy capacity and, uh, you know, that's a good thing and, and hopefully we can continue that trend. So let's see, going through, <clears throat> yeah, the levy and the amount to be raised. Actually, yeah, okay, here is the new total that I was just uh, seeing. So we had a, a something different here, this 37 million. <clears throat> so things have changed. Um, these are our valuations right now by class before the tax shift and the, the percentages. Um, also, there's some uh, additional information that relates to this in the other PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> information you know about the tax rates and the potential shifting we're using 1964 here as an example but that that number has changed it's gone up uh, you know with my most recent check it's gone up a few pennies so I think we're at 1970 right now but this will give us an idea of basically kind of where we're at here's where our tax history has gone over the last few years from 2019 to 2023 uh, finally down below $20 um, you know, that's, that's nice and hopefully gets us out of the top 10. We were the top, uh, you know, in the top three for tax rate. <clears throat> There's a little bit of information about if we chose to shift the tax rate and it shows some of the different factors and the significance of the impact of what that would be for the single average single family tax bill, as well as the average commercial tax bill. Uh, a little bit of a more specific look at single family homes and two to three family homes uh, with a comparison between 22 and 23. If there's any questions at any time, please, you know, pipe, pipe in and let me know. But our basically our recommendations are going to be for adopting a single tax rate that would be applied to all the classes of property. So there's five classes of property. There's residential, commercial, industrial, personal property. And the one that I left out is open space. And that usually comes second. We don't have or haven't adopted open space as a class of property. And that's another thing that we would recommend that we're gonna stick with those same classes of property and that we don't need, we're handling open space in a different capacity here in Greenfield. So that's uh, you know something that I just wanted to mention that it is part of the conversation, but we're not really talking about it much because we're something that we don't do. <clears throat> um, so we have the potential to vote for a shift and we gave a little bit more information about that. 
Um, we're recommending just to keep the single tax rate and apply that. There's other exemptions that we'll be voting on, a residential exemption, which is an exemption of not more than 20% of the average assessed value of one class, you know, the residential class usually. So basically we would be assessing at a percentage of our full fair cash value as opposed to the you know 100% right now we're at 100% there are some towns that it is but for the most part it's just a, a way to um, you know look at the numbers a little bit differently you, in the, the bottom line is that you're going to end up with the same the, the same bottom line <clears throat> so we don't recommend that we uh, have or adopt a residential exemption. There's also a small commercial exemption and I put in a little bit more information. You know, you have to be class three commercial to qualify for this, be occupied solely as a business with an average annual amount of uh, um, employment of 10 uh, employees or under at all of the locations during your prior calendar year. So yeah, go over a few of the different qualifications for this. Uh, the assessment has to be under a million dollars. This is something that we haven't ad adopted in the past, and we are also now recommending that we don't adopt it now. Um, you know, while it has some good intentions, uh, a lot of these smaller businesses and the businesses that would qualify don't own the the property that they're they're leasing or renting for their business. And so it, it kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish when we're doing that. And that's another reason why we're recommending to stay away from that at this point. Um, so then we have a summary of our assessed values the way they stand now. And um, I actually got some input and I'll be trying to put something together and, and get out to the, the committee that shows a, a comparison between last year and this year. Um, value-wise, uh, something that's a little bit more specific so you can see exactly um, where the different counts went and what, what values changed and, and where and when. <clears throat> so let me see, that is... Let me see, where's my other presentation? How's that look? That looks fine. Yeah, that's okay. great. And so here we are with a, a presentation, just a little bit of information, you know, some feel good pictures of downtown. Uh, this is a, a, you know, an outline of, of the information and the way it's presented. The notice of the classification hearing. So obviously that's not tonight, but it's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I give a little bit of an example of the different um, the different classes of property. And the assessed uh, values in the prior years. So basically giving you an idea of where the average single family tax bill is. So the average assessment for residential single family properties was 194,450 in FY 20 and where it's gone in 21 and 22. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so we have the mean and the, the median. So the mean is the average and the median is the middle. So when we're looking at all of them, you know, and there's a hundred, well, number 50 is where this 181, 200 would, would come in and, uh, you know, the 189 and so on. <clears throat> Below is commercial information about the average commercial tax bill and a comparison of where we've, where we've been and where we've gone to. And then this is sort of uh, part of what was asked is this comparison. And I went back to 2018 with what our total values were for all these different classes of property, residential, commercial, industrial, personal property, and our total valuation. I also included the amount of, of value that we have that is exempt from taxation. So that that is, you know, different nonprofits and schools and municipal buildings and, and that type of thing. 
uh, also where our tax rate has been. And we still have the question mark here. We're not sure exactly where it's going to end up, but we're working toward that. And hopefully you're going to have our final approval before the council meeting uh, tomorrow. Uh, we have our total values uh, sort of to get a visual, uh, you know, residential value. This is includes not just single family homes, but uh, two families, three families. It includes condominiums. It includes apartments, uh, commercial and industrial. Um, we can we have a small industrial base, and uh, you know we can see that the personal property uh, you know accounts for a, a pretty good chunk. So moving on, <clears throat> well, I'm doing a value comparison. Oh, actually, you know what? This is sort of what was asked for. Here's that comparison that we have with the different classes of property mm -hmm. and where we were with FY22 and where we are now. Um, now I did uh, get some comments from Ginny and she was asking about this parcel difference. And that difference is all of the classes of property. So mm -hmm. uh, all, all of the, the, the subclasses in the residential. So um, there were really only six new houses, not, it doesn't mean that we have 22 new single family homes, but we have, a, you know, a combination of some, uh, you know, that have uh, changed. We had, you know, ones that went from a three family to a two family. And I think we had one that went the other way also. And then there were, you know, a lot of uh, uh, two family homes, I think that were started. So I can give a better breakdown if anyone's interested to get that information. But, um, you know, here we are in our, our comparison of where we were and, and the, the increases or, you know, the amounts that we're seeing uh, percentage uh, in the assessed value and difference. I put in some information about the personal property or part, pardon me, personal property, but the personal exemptions. And so this uh, takes care of our seniors and veterans, uh, all of the different classes of the veteran uh, exemptions. Um, you know, we have uh, exemption for blind people, the elderly, we even have our senior work off and the veteran work off that are included here with these exemptions. And I thought it would be some good information or um, interesting, hopefully for you to see the number of exemptions that we have and the total amount. And these are, you know, amounts that we're building up our overlay so that we have a sufficient amount because that's where a lot of the reimbursement is, is realized through. <clears throat> then I went on to do some more uh, value comparisons from a single tax rate at the time we were using that 1964. And so then this is where we would be. And depending on the where your value lies, and I did have some input, uh, but wasn't able to change things. I'll work on it for tomorrow, but to also show these lower amounts, lower than 250. So 150 and, uh, you know, maybe 200, 150 and 100. I'll, I'll try and work that in so that we've got that additional information, but it gives you an idea. <clears throat> and then in the conversation, if we're talking about a split tax rate and we had shown these different factors that were in the table in the, um, the other text that we had that was the Word document, um, you know, the, these I used a couple of the factors that he had displayed, this 1.1 factor. And so if it was a 1.1 factor, the the, residential rate would go down to 1901 and there'd be a commercial rate of 2161. And then it shows again, using these values and then uh, the average single family value for FY23 is 258,317. And I use that as an example here. And so it, it kind of shows you the differences on this 1.1 factor, the next one with the 1.2 and 1.3. So as you get in, to the higher factors, the residential rate is going down and making a little bit of a difference. And then, um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, a, a, you know, what the impact is on the, the commercial properties and, and how much more of the burden that they are gonna have to, uh, to take on. Then I wanted to do a comparison of some of the other towns that are similar to ours. And I had a little bit of debate and, and was looking for input, but we kind of couldn't decide exactly what towns we felt were the closest in comparison. And so I decided that I was going to let the, uh, the, the values themselves determine. It. And what I've done here is I've done a residential value comparison, and I looked at the, the values for all of these different towns, and I basically went with four below and four above us. So the residential value will be this column, the residential column. And you can see that, you know, Sterling 
uh, is a little bit smaller than Spencer, which is a little bit smaller than Sturbridge. And here we are right in the middle. And then Gardner is, is uh, you know, one billion three hundred eighteen million two hundred twenty nine thousand and ninety nine dollars. So I went and, and you can see some of the different ones that we have these different towns like Oxford, I think, is one that will come up in more than one category. Here's the commercial value comparison doing the same thing. So now we're in this this column here where uh, Great Barrington's commercial value is two hundred sixty six million seven hundred forty three thousand eight hundred eleven and uh, ending in Bellingham. And, and uh, you can see some of the different comparables when we're looking at it from the commercial uh, out, mm -hmm. outlook. So again, I did the same thing with industrial and here we are industrial and some of the different uh, places that come up. And I thought just for, um, and, and you know, the, we well, also the last class of properties, a personal property value comparison, mm -hmm. where we're looking at places that are similar in size, personal property wise, and the different places that are coming up. And some, some do repeat. So that gives us a better idea. And then I went for a total value comparison. So all of the total value, and there's Oxford again, uh, like I had mentioned before, Great Barrington was in there more than once. Um, and then last but not least, I thought, let's look at things by a tax levy, from a tax levy viewpoint. So how much are we taxing? <clears throat> and, and it's the total tax levy that we're looking at here, this column here. So this total levy, uh, Winthrop is 35 billion 600, or 35 million, pardon me, Six hundred seventy-seven thousand eight hundred sixty-four dollars, going all the way down to Abington, which has a thirty-nine million dollar budget. And so here we are, right in the middle, with uh, thirty-seven million two eleven, and that was from last year, I'm pretty sure. And um, so basically, uh, trying to present some information and give a few different looks to um, to to show the council and the people from the Ways and Means that. Um, you know, where we're at and, uh, you know, a, a different way to kind of look at things and compare uh, to different towns as opposed to just going from a, a pure census uh, and, and population um, aspect. And I'm, I'm happy to have, because we'll be doing this again before you know it, um, to have any input right now after the fact of anything that you liked or that you thought you would like to see in addition, uh, we can work that information up and have it ready for the next time we're going to do this and, and uh, hopefully present it in a, in a, a form that you're going to be more comfortable with or, or you know, I'm, I'm happy to have you guys participate in the crafting of the information that we're presenting to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, I also want to make mention of back in, I believe it was April, I think it might have been. Um, Assessor Geisman did a very nice presentation for us back then. Um, we didn't actually take a vote on any of the information that he submitted, but it did start off our process and gave us a lot of things to think about. I know there are there is one new member to uh, our Ways and Means Committee, uh, but the others on Ways and Means did hear that presentation as well. So we do appreciate um, the things that have been coming forward out of that office. Um, I'm gonna open it up to the members of Ways and Means. Do you have any questions for any one of our assessors uh, on any topic that's been presented here this evening? Uh, Councilor Golub. Um, I just wanna start by appreciating the work that you put into this. And naming that, that my key takeaway is that as a counselor, I need to take a class in municipal finance and really wrap my name around this. I didn't have an opportunity to, with, a, with work this week to sit down. I feel like I need a dictionary with, I really appreciate the, the glossary that you put at the beginning. And I feel like I need a dictionary to uh, understand all of it. So I, that's my big takeaway. And I'm really um, going to be listening to guidance from my fellow counselors tonight. Um, my one question, and I feel like I wish it was something about what you what you prepared because I, I see the work that you put into this. Um, but my, my one question was, 
that the hearing is tomorrow night at, at 6.30 and that's the same time that, okay, I just answered it for myself. It will be at the city council meeting. I just wanted to be sure that we would be privy to the information there. So I'm looking forward to that. And that's, that's all I have for right now, but thank you. Yes, they, the, the, um, the assessors group will be um, at our meeting tomorrow evening to answer any questions and make a presentation if it's necessary. Um, again, before we take a vote uh, on the uh, residential factors and setting our tax rate. Um, others on our committee. Can I just have one follow up to that? Sure. This document says that it's at City Hall second floor. Um, that I think that's what threw me off. Yeah. But it, do people, does the public know that this will be, we're at John's on tomorrow, right? And so do, will the public uh, yes, know we that? Really, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, it is posted. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep, that was posted. my error. Sorry about that. <laughs> you had a lot. It's to okay. <laughs> We're all unpredictable. I do want to, um, Council Golub, I do want to say that uh, this is not easy stuff uh, to understand. It really is. And I know this is your first, um, your first uh, uh, plunge into municipal finance. And this is a particularly um, complicated equation to kind of wrap your head around. So uh, I'm not sure uh, that you're alone when you are talking about what it is that uh, that you're seeing and, and what you're understanding. So I just want to throw that out. Um, is there anybody else that on our committee that would really like to speak to any of this at this point? I'm trying to go through here looking for you. Councilor Healy. Uh, please go ahead, Councilor Healy. I again appreciate all the effort put into that um, presentation. I just had a few questions on the presentation itself, and maybe some input for future presentations. Um, the the set tax rate that is kind of fluctuating around the nineteen point something dollars per thousand. Um, I assume that accounts for the free cash going back into the budget. Okay. Yes. And then, secondly, just some information that. I would find helpful on the presentation. And I know um, we looked at comparable towns based on um, tax levy and those items such, but I still think it would be beneficial to know the population of the community and the average income of the community as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else? Counselors. Uh, Chris? Yes, Chris? go ahead, Councilor DeSorga. Um, so that was, that was fabulous. For those of us who, who've been watching these classification hearings, I just have to say that was the most thorough presentation that I, I think we've ever seen. I loved the part about the comparison uh, to other cities, uh, and we've never actually had anyone who went over what it would be if we did the shift and how that would uh, how that would affect the residential and the commercial. And that was that was superb. I also wanted to say um, to give credit where it was due, our our new principal assess, assessor. Uh, Randy Austin's done a remarkable job in keeping up with um, uh, the reporting of new growth, which I think that's up um, close to 50%, and that's something that's never going to go away. Um, and likewise, under his leadership, the, the personal property assessment has increased similarly. That was up almost 50% too. Um, so uh, that looks fabulous. And um, uh, Randy and I had have discussed a little bit about the importance of building permits. This is actually how we know um, what properties have been built and improved on and how we accurately and fairly assess the value of all properties in Greenfield. 
I'm going to vote for the single tax rate. It's going to allow our businesses to flourish, which benefits everybody, actually. Um, however, the process lacks a little bit of credibility when the chair of the Board of Assessors is asked to stop work on his own commercial properties as he's not attained building permits. And that's my whole comment for the night. But it was a well, very well done presentation. But we have to emphasize those building permits and their accuracy. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Toronto, is there anything with, you would like to speak to? Um, yeah, I was noticing the, the personal property um, hike as well there. Um, I guess <clears throat> what, this may be naive, naivety speaking, um, what falls under that classification? Um, it's, it's kind of one of those fluid terms that gets used a lot because I mean, cars, you pay a personal property tax on, we just call it an excise tax here. But uh, what, what falls under that category? And I guess if that was, if I'm reading this right, if that was uh, a minus seven uh, difference, but a 45% increase, what, what I guess would account for that? Was that just better in enforcement? Um, I don't know, this, this, this section, that one, that one class right there is really uh, throwing me for a loop. <laughs> okay, so who, who, can, who would like to answer that for us? Just go right ahead. I could, uh, I could probably field that question. Thank so you. yeah, we did have a big increase in the value of our overall personal property. So personal property, what is it? So it's the assets of a business uh, that are used, you know, um, in, in the course of their business to, to, you know, part of how they make their money. So here's an example. Um, you know, I've got my rider lawnmower. And that's my rider lawnmower. Well, as soon as I mow somebody else's lawn with it and get paid, that's personal property of my business. Um, you know, of course, we're on another level and there's, there's all sorts of exemptions with manufacturing and that type of thing. But, you know, furnitures and fixtures, if you're in a retail store, it's all of the display cases and that type of thing. Um, you know, I, I can try and come up with a more comprehensive list or put some information together because I think that's a good, uh, you know, legitimate question. What, you know, what are the contents? What is the, the personal property? So I'll try and put something together like that. But uh, one of the big things that we see and one of the, the largest values that we have are from, you know, the power companies. And what, what has happened is that we've had a, a new um, methodology in the way those are valued that's been getting tossed around for the last few years and it's gone to several ATB uh, you know appellate tax board case decisions uh, you know versus the city of Boston versus the city of Springfield these high level cases uh, to determine because basically this is how the power companies have done it they use a net book value where they're basically depreciating the majority of their assets down to zero and then telling us, well, this is what, you know, this is the value and what it should be. And we're taking, have been for many years, taking them on their word. But now we've had certain companies that started keeping track of the different sales of these companies. Now, as you can imagine, they don't change hands, um, you know, quite often, but you know, eventually they do. And if we start tracking the data, we can say, okay, well, you're saying that this is the value of your assets, but when you make your sale, you know, it looks like you're getting, you know, quite a bit more. And so it's been a debate on what are we going to use net book value or, uh, you know, what we call uh, replacement cost, new, less depreciation. So let's figure out what your assets are for that telephone pole, for instance, um, you know, well, you can't just depreciate it down to nothing because the pole is still there and you're going to get some credit for that when you go ahead and sell it. So that has been the big change that happened and, and it basically increased this, you know, largest asset by about, you know, another additional 40%. And that's, you know, that's where we saw this big gain in the value of personal property. That's really where it has come from and, and why we haven't seen it before. It, it was 
getting, uh, you know, going around back and forth with, uh, with the ATB cases and, and everyone kind of trying to decide, you know, what is, what is the true value? And they, you know, with the wisdom of Solomon decided that they were going to split down the middle and not use the replacement cost, uh, new less depreciation, the RCNLD. Instead, they would use, you know, but not use the net book value. So they use like a 50-50 blend of these two. And that's where we have gained this, this additional value. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, um, I hope that was. I, I'm just. Yeah. I'm going to call. I'm going to call on um, Assessor Gary. Um, I think he has something to add to this line. Yeah. So that'd be uh, well, great. you you can tell Randy's great for our office because he can bore you with the facts. Um, <laughs> he also did I a really great job <laughs> analyzing the um, electric company this year and found a quite a, a, a mistake in the past and, and that was great. Uh, a couple of things with personal property, the first $10,000 of a business's uh, personal property is exempt. So we're taxing everything at $10,000 and above. And, and I just wanted to kind of comment on uh, Councillor Healy, this, the, another reason our rate has gone down, it has to do with the values of our properties have gone up. So obviously we all have been watching the sales uh, in the marketplace and that probably is also a factor. And then lastly, um, Councilor Golub, welcome. Um, so just so you know, like this, the, we are waiting for, we submitted all of our information, we as in the, the assessors, to the Department of Revenue. They review it and then they basically rubber stamp it or, or, or if, if it's, there's some things that need to be corrected, which I believe uh, Assessor Austin got a response back. Our hope is that we get their uh, approval before 6 30 tomorrow and then you can either vote on that or table it or whatever you decide to do um but that's kind of the process so our hope is that we do have it for the council to make a decision tomorrow but if it if the dor has not approved it in that time period then it goes to the next meeting so just want everyone to know that that's a situation and obviously if we waited to the end of december that meeting uh, it makes it challenging to get the tax bills out before January 1st. In the past, there has been a special meeting that the councilors have had. We do not want you to do extra meetings, obviously, but just kind of give you a little history and, and welcome to the team. Thank you very much. Um, Councilor Golem. Yeah, I was just um, confused by what Ginny, by what Councilor Sorger had said. At the and I don't know who this question is to, but I think that I heard something like um, I think that you said building permits not being pulled, and I don't know wh like what what that's about, um, and who's not pulling building permits. Um, yeah. Would Would you like me to address it, or are we focusing on the tax stuff? I don't know what we prefer to do here. Well, that's a very good, that's very good as well. Um, hmm. Hang on here just a second. I think that the concern around permits, uh, and I'm not sure, and I don't wanna speak for Jenny, but part of what she's trying to point out is that that's where a lot of our growth comes from. It's we're tipped off by the building permit process on all of the improvements that are happening in town. So if there's new construction, they're getting a permit and we're finding out about it or hopefully everyone with whatever they're doing is getting a new permit, uh, a permit so that that's on our radar. We look at them all and not everyone is a value changing permit, but it's something that we still need to make sure that we're on top of. Uh, for example, if you're getting a new roof, either you have a roof or you don't have a roof. And so I can't micromanage everyone's roof and the age of everyone's roof to, to, to figure out, you know, so, so if it's a different material, well, it's metal roof now, then I'm going to make some sort of change. But I, we're not going out and doing inspections on every little thing that happens, every trench that is dug. But we want to get every deck and every shed and every pool and uh, uh, every, every improvement because that's what accumulates to the new taxable growth. So, so growth is new tax dollars, dollars that have never been taxed before. And um, 
you know, that, that helps us out in the long run to do a lot of different things o o over the, the long uh, part of the process. So we wanna make sure that all permits are being pulled and, and that the assessor's office is on top of every permit that's happening and doing our inspections so that we're capturing correctly the, the data on those new improvements and, and capturing that value as accurate new growth. And that's also part of what we're doing right now. We're submitting that growth information to the Department of Revenue for their approval. And so we've, we're going back and forth with them and making sure that we have sufficient explanation and comments so that they're able to verify the information that we're submitting. So I hope, I'm not sure if that covers everything, but that's part of what I feel she was trying to get across. That helps define it and I'm, I'm curious. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Desorga, did I see your hand up? Yes, I just wanted to say, I wasn't actually very comfortable talking about that, but if it was a one-time thing, I wouldn't have said anything, but according to the building inspector, that was not the first time. And I think, you know, we're all held to a higher standard when we serve in office. And I just feel as if that is extraordinarily important. I would feel that way about myself. And it is, this represents something that's higher than us. And we encourage every citizen to do that. So um, I'm going to leave it at that and we'll move forward and onward to the next thing. But I, I thought it was important to say. And I also wanted to point out that, you know, uh, the residential has gone up, you, uh, the percentage, if you've noticed. So um, last last year, I think it was the, the tax burden, the uh, residential homeowner was 74.98% and this year the you know residential is 75.6 and uh, th there's a decrease in commercial so we have to make sure that all those things are done so that's up but it was a fabulous presentation and I definitely think the single tax rate is the way to go we we need to keep we need to keep our businesses going that's what keeps all of us going so that's it uh, Council Golub, is that answer your question? I'm not sure, but I don't want to take much more time um, with my questions. I don't, I am discerning which are important to ask and which aren't, but I, that just, <laughs> like, wait, what? Um, but I'm good for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Assessor Geisman, I see your hand up. Um, you know, thanks. Um, f first of all, uh, I'm, I'm new to all this, but I, I can tell you that uh, Randy is <clears throat> are just really great to work with. I've learned a lot from him and, uh, you know, I appreciate, uh, you know, Joe's uh, presence as well as Randy's. Uh, but the comment I was going to make about uh, building permits is it, it is important for them to be pulled. Uh, it is also important for them to be closed. But I think even more important is the value that is uh, ascribed on those uh, building permits should be accurate. Um, I, I, you know, oh, you're broke. You've, you've kind of broken the connection here. I'm not seeing you or hearing you. Jim? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, now I can see you. Okay, we're good. Sorry. Um, you know, the, the problem is that often the estimates which will drive uh, new growth, um, you know, are suspect. And I, I think it's not only pulling the permits and closing them in a timely manner, but also making sure that the, uh, uh, the estimates that are on, on the permits and the, uh, the description of work is accurate. Um, and, you know, I think uh, people that file the permits, uh, you know, they file them under a threat of uh, perjury. And uh, I... Oh, you've, you're frozen again or breaking up. Well, he's got a good point. And a lot of times those permits are put in under, uh, you know, they, they generalize, and then they heap a lot of stuff on after and, and add it in. 
And I don't know what the answer is, but Jim, you're definitely you're, you're definitely right. The, the accuracy of that, you know, that doesn't necessarily drive the value, but it gives us a better idea of what's going on. And so that's why the assessor's office needs to be doing its due diligence and getting out and doing inspections on all of these properties. Um, you know, while we have the opportunity to make sure that we're properly cap capturing the value and the improvements that are happening at the property. Thank you. Um, Councilor Healy, I see your hand. You've been very patient. Sure. Yeah. I, I Again, I want to comment on the building permit portion, and I know it's not a big subject, but I want to clarify some things. Um, certain work does not require a building permit. So um, painting, redoing a ceiling, tile floors, you know, TLC work does not require a permit. Um, so, you, you know, I, I don't know what work's being done, but, you know, we also got to be tread lightly because we don't we don't know all the facts behind the information so you know it's just un, unclear to me and i wouldn't want to make a judgment you know but anyways in the second part of the permit there's there's a big issue right and and people are deterred to pull building permits because our building department is inadequately staffed right and the delays that they cause homeowners in their renovation process having to wait for an inspection for three weeks to close up a wall um might deter some people from even pulling the permit right so we need to in the grand scheme of things if we want to improve that we got to help the building department out and find ways to get them help because they can't keep up and it's going to deter people from wanting to pull those permits because they're not going to wait people aren't patient and that's all i have to say thank you very much i'm going to uh, move the conversation away from building permits at this point just telling everybody publicly that if you're gonna do any kind of significant work, please call the building inspections office and figure out what it is you need and get on a time frame and everything else. I think it's most important for us. The other thing that happens is that it's done to code. And that was one of the banes of my existence when I was mayor is making sure that work was done up to code. Uh, not enough to say, oh, I thought it might work this way or that way. That doesn't help. It doesn't build property value. It doesn't help citizen safety. So now that I've finished that lecture, um, are there any more questions about, uh, I'm going to ask us to vote uh, on a tax classification to make a recommendation for council tomorrow night. Uh, if there's no more questions from counselors at this point. Okay, so I'm gonna try to see all of you here. Uh, all those in favor of the recommendation of a one, one minimum residential factor, uh, please raise your hand and indicate aye. 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 Okay, uh, anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we are going to recommend a single tax rate, residential factor one, um, to council tomorrow evening. Let me just write that down. Okay, well, I want to thank the assessors for being with us this evening. I really appreciate the uh, I'll echo everybody else this evening that said this is a wonderful conversation. It has been really well presented. It makes us feel comfortable, which is kind of what we need to do in order to make our votes. Leave it to professionals, listen to recommendations, and then that gives us an element of comfort when we make rec recommendations to the full council uh, and go on from there. So thank you all for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. Council Jasorga, you're muted, Jenny. My bad. Um, I think there might possibly be two more parts of that, Councilor Forgey, with the the minimum. You're right. Oh, so, sorry to overstep. No, no. Minimum no, residential no. factor and the residential no residential exemption before they left oh. us. Lest yes, we had it's perfectly fine. And thank you for calling that to my attention. See, I get confused about all this stuff too. All right. Um, 
So our next uh, recommendation going out to council is that we vote that no residential exemption be adopted for fiscal year 2023. If everybody is comfortable with that, I would say all in favor of that recommendation, please indicate aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And the next one um, is that, this, that uh, <laughs> there is a recommendation that uh, the city council votes that no small com commercial exemption be adopted for fiscal year 2023. Any discussion? Everybody who uh, everybody who is in favor of that recommendation, please indicate. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, that's it. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate that very much. And thank you, Ginny, for pointing that out to me. <laughs> <coughs> thank you. Good All night, right. everybody. Good night. And thank you again for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Um, the next the next piece we should basically go through quite quickly because we did this at last month's meeting. So we made our recommendations already. Uh, if there is any of those recommendations that people want to revisit at this point, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, otherwise, what we uh, recommended will still stand and go out to council tomorrow evening. Uh, anybody want to discuss a particular recommendation that we made on a particular appropriation? Council DeSorgan. Um, yes, I think that, as I recall, and I, I couldn't find this, I didn't rewatch the meeting, but I think we might have vo voted, but I had a second thought on the capital um, stabilization. And I'm gonna start actually first with a question for Director Gilman, if I may. Sure, go right ahead. So um, for us to move money from one stabilization account to another, um, Director Gilman, that requires a financial financial order, and Correct. how is for the transfer? Yes, so, and and how many votes to transfer it from one account to another? Is it is it seven or nine? So to take it out, yes, of the original one is two thirds, right? But to put it in the other is not. Is mm -hmm. his majority? Thank unless you. you're unless you're creating a brand new one, and always creating a brand new stabilization is also two thirds. Well, okay. So so I just not to throw not to throw a wrench into what we did last time. I actually was in favor of the two five going in because I was thinking that we might possibly be paying um, for. Uh, the extra expenditures for the fire station from uh, from one of our stabilization accounts, and that wasn't what what we ended up doing. This is more money than we've ever put into capital stabilization. Yeah. yeah. May I? Yes. Go ahead. Continue. Okay. Uh, I, I, believe, I, I could be. I, I actually did not go through the whole history, Director Gilman. So, but we are would be up to where we were. It's a high figure to put in there, and I was in light of, I was going to make a recommendation to lower that by a small amount because we've heard of, we know that our DPW workers, which is 70 employees, their uh, contract will be coming up. Um, and we have our, and our teachers and IAs are also in the middle of negotiations. They're the, it's the largest amount of people who they're certainly not, they're not overpaid by any matter of means and have gotten small raises. I was gonna make a motion to decrease that to $2,200,000 in the hopes 
that we would be putting more into contractual stabilization. In the end, we can always, with a financial order, be moving things around, but it's difficult to negotiate contracts if you're not sure that you have the money to pay for them. And I did review after Derek, uh, Council Healy, brought up about the ESSER funds, I went a little bit more in depth and I can see, uh, and I'm not gonna go all through this, but what the schools actually have in different reserve accounts of theirs, some of which can only be used for certain things. So my thought was to reduce that amount into capital stabilization to, I, I would move or, or, or we can talk about it but I would make a, uh, a motion to, to decrease that to $2,200,000, what's going into capital stabilization. And I have reviewed the, the, state, the capital requests. That's my motion. Okay, am I, so what am I speaking? Can I speak now? Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, so um, you really need to understand the process for funding um, negotiations to, to state that um, as it is, um, all those negotiations are for next year with the exception of um, the teachers. So in other words, the contract stabilization amount, um, the way it should be handled and we try to handle it is that you, when you're in negotiations for a future year, we will be doing the 24 budget and you will put out guidelines of, of what departments are to increase their budget. And the capital or the contract stabilization, I'm sorry, is used because it's not always perfect, you know? Um, the other thing I would say to you is I'm very familiar with um, funding. Um, the school department does have funds. Um, school choice is pretty much what's allowed any, any pretty much any legal municipal expense. Um, secondly, I would say that um, the contracts haven't been negotiated and the school did receive a million two fifty more this year. Um, and secondly, yes, the ESSER can be used to that. And there's um, at least three million dollars left um, in the ESSER funds. So it's a matter in terms of the city contracts, it will be handled by the 24 budgets. And um, putting guidelines out to the department heads, yes, we're in negotiations. You know, I'm, I'm just gonna throw out a number. This is not, you know, I want people to add 3% for increases. And then when it's all said and done, if it's not perfect, yes, then you go to contract stabilization. What people need to realize is that contract stabilization is actually a funding cliff. And most people will understand that. It's a one-time fund. Um, in the next year's budget, you know, you aren't gonna cut people's salaries and they're gonna have steps again. So your two and a half has to be able to absorb that in the following year. So this is why it's really important to manage this um, and to understand how the contract process works and what available funding departments do have to them. Um, and secondly, I would also say that the capital is very, very important because you don't wanna get in the deferred maintenance hole that we have been slowly, slowly, slowly digging out of. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's um, wise to cut the capital stabilization. Um, it is more than necessary because you can't spend it all. We need to leave some because we have very important bonding coming up that the rating agencies will look at our balances and they want it to, to, they would like to even see it improve, but they certainly don't want to see it go down. So last year at this time, 
we had a million dollars in capital stabilization. We need to leave a million after we get through the 24 capital improvement program. Um, so this is, you know, there's a lot of aspects to this. As, as Councilor Golub said, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of, of concepts, a lot of um, terms to understand. Um, but this really is the most responsible way to do this. Um, the negotiations, as far as I'm, you know, they could have happened all this year. There was funding available. Um, and in the past, I also can tell you that every single year, with the exception of one year since contract stabilization was established, either 200,000 has gone in or 350 and sometimes zero and sometimes 75,000. So there's not a history of huge amounts coming out of there. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I do wanna say right now that um, we are only making recommendations. So I have to go back to Councillor DeSorger and ask if you uh, want us, want the Ways and Means Committee to consider uh, a reduction in that dollar amount. And since you put the motion out there, you're gonna need, we're gonna need a second and we're gonna need a vote on that. And this is an argument, my opinion, that um, is better served tomorrow night on council floor. Yeah. So if you want to withdraw the motion, Councilor DeSorger, uh, that is one option. I'm gonna tell you what to do, but um, it, it's, it's up to you at this point. So what, what is your preference? You, you know what, in an effort to, for my fellow counselors that, I, that I, I like, I'm happy to withdraw my motion and take it up on the floor of the council. And uh, Director Gilman, I, you made a very valid point uh, about the funding about the funding cliff. I understand that. I know um, that each of those departments then has to be able to absorb in their budgets going forward, whatever those increases are. I just also know that our teachers, which I think it's 178, the largest group, they're well over a year, be, be well over a year, and so it's. It's fine. I'm going to withdraw my motion. We can take it up on the floor at another time. Okay. Um, Mayor, I'm going to put you on hold for a minute. I see you. Catherine, um, Council Golub, did you have any questions? No, I would have, I will speak on it tomorrow. Okay, very yes. good. Um, so the motion is, Ginny, have you withdrawn that formally? I have. Okay. All right. I am going to ask that. We have no more discussion about this in Ways and Means because this is a recommendation going out to council tomorrow evening. Um, I will just say that we will be asked tomorrow uh, what the recommendation from the council was. Um, and if there's any discussion about that, if anybody wants to um, talk about the nuances to all of this, I would encourage them to do so. But at this point, I really want to get through and get our recommendations out to council floor. So if the recommendations from last month's meeting stand, we really have completed our work. Uh, is there anybody in agreement or disagreement at this particular time? Um, anything? I'll agree with you. I don't like to do work twice. Okay, thank you. I thank you. think that's a very important thing and our time and our family lives are all valuable. So I'm going to let it go with that. Okay. Any other counselors, please? Are you good with letting it go forward? I'm looking at Councillor Healy and Councillor Taranzo. Do you want to discuss? You're on mute. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Can I just be reminded, because uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember what our recommendation was versus the discussion that kind of came up. Um, having to do with the next one that was following was the uh, compensated absences fund. 
Right. Okay, so compensated absences. Um, you'll have to refresh my memory too. I know that everything ended up being a positive recommendation, but I'm not sure it was unanimous. Okay. Okay. Um, did you, are, does everybody understand what a compensated absence is? Okay. So you're just looking for what it, what our vote was. Right. I mean, if I was just going to blatantly confirm that we were reaffirming our previous uh, recommendations, I was, I was trying to be refreshed on what that recommendation was. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I know what, I know what my recommendation is on it. I was saying as a committee. Okay. Okay. Um, well, we, we don't, I, I guess the question is, I can't answer that 100% certain. I do know that most of these went, they all passed, but I do think that some of them were not unanimous and I will have that information for tomorrow night. And so we don't really have to vote on anything else at this point, at least that's the way I see it because our recommendations are already in and then we'll vote again tomorrow evening. Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay. I'm, I'm raising my hand, Councillor Fortune. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see you. Go right That's ahead, fine. please. Um, I'm, again, this may be the same situation where I would raise this concern tomorrow. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to, how to present this, but um, I've given this one a lot of thought and um, it makes a lot of sense to me to have a fund to pay folks when they're retiring. Um, I get why we need enough money in that. And I'm really uncomfortable with this one, given the fact that there is no policy to equitably distribute the funds and that at least for the last four years, DPW has not been, has not accessed the funds and that all buyouts have come from their, at least from the information, I see your face, I, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Director I'm really Gilman. Sorry. Um, really but sorry. at least from the information that I've received, it the the buyouts are, are coming from their operation upper operating budget, and so I I this is I would I don't know if the recommendation is to table it until there is such a policy that outlines that that different departments can can access it. I don't, I don't know, but I, I really feel uncomfortable with the fact that that currently does not It exist. does happen though. It, it may is. happen, but if there's no policy and- But wait, wait a minute. Okay. The, the main yeah. point you're trying to do is avoid a deficit. I'm not gonna give a department money if they're not going to have a deficit. That's not equitable, that's just sensible. Okay. I, <laughs> Point of order. I just, I'm learning here and I would rather not be shouted at. <laughs> that's, that's perfectly fine. So let's just, again, this is probably, there are probably other counselors that um, need some more recommendation on this. I mean, they need some um, discussion on this. I will, I will try briefly to clarify for you a little bit. Um, it's a, it's a fund in the past, you know, you already mentioned this, if somebody was retiring or leaving, the, um, department would have to go bottom line to figure out how they were going to pay this out. And that shorts the department from things that they need in that operating year, in that fiscal year, it, it puts them in a bind. Um, so Compensated absences is a good idea, but it is not accessed every year by every department. It is just um, refreshed or renewed. And so as the need arises, each department accesses the funds. You don't know when somebody's gonna retire. You don't know when somebody's gonna leave and take a new job, but there are payouts per contracts. And that's basically what the fund does is it replenishes a department that otherwise would have had to take it bottom line and lose valuable dollars towards their operation. The other thing is, I don't think, this is my opinion, I don't think it's possible to put a policy in place because this is not a policy piece. Uh, to me, it means that this is a contract negotiation 
Um, it is a benefit that comes to individual employees through contract negotiation. It's an obligation. And instead of having an unfunded liability out there uh, that departments can't meet, we're putting the funds in a fund and it's there when anybody needs to access the fund. It's kind of like a community chest if you play Monopoly. Uh, it's kind of like that uh, where, again, it's not necessarily first come first served. It's on a rotating basis and we replenish the funds and then anybody who has the need accesses that so that the departments are not dragged down um, by lack of funding. So I don't see how you could write that into a policy. It's, a pra it's more like a practice rather than a policy. Does that help? I'm just, I mean, again, this is, this is probably something that needs a bigger venue to be discussed in, but you, you guys tell me. Um, Mike Taranzo, Councillor Taranzo. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying there that, you know, when we're, I think I said this at the last council floor, um, is this is essentially part of a contract that's already been negotiated. We're upholding the end of the contract. Um, if we're offering people sick leave, paid time off in whatever form it comes, and then they're banking that and they cash out on it because they retire, or, you know, they get, you know, terminated, whatever, they decide to move on. Um, we're still obligated to pay that. And, and I think that's been stated. I think there's a lot of, like, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's been some, some things just don't seem to make sense on a uh, on a like a one to one level. I run into this with state funding all the time. We can't draw against our emergency funds until our operating is gone, which just seems ridiculous to me because you can only use the emergency fund for certain classifications of things. So if that happens at the beginning of your fiscal year, you're kind of hosed because you have to use your operating, and then you end up kind of falling short there. So it it doesn't always make complete sense when this can be drawn these types of things can be drawn against but i don't I, I think this one in general has also been hit with a bunch of um i don't know conspiratorial kind of comments um whether it's been in our emails or or whatnot and i don't think that it's not everything is um is some is some back room deal or something you know what i mean like these are just things that we have to have in place to honor agreements that because even like last council time um we're, we were talking about putting more money into the contract stabilization but then cutting from the compensated absences which to me seems so backward well kind of mundane because you're you're taken from one because you're saying it's important to honor a contract and be able to negotiate in good faith and then you're pulling off the back end of them being like look remember that time we negotiated in good faith well now we don't have enough money to uphold that so I, I don't, I think that the, the, the cloak and dagger doesn't exist in this situation. This is really just, yeah. you know, honoring what we're supposed to be doing if we have people with contracts. Thank you. Uh, Councilor DeSorga. I actually really listened to my fellow councilors on this la last time I did and uh, there were points that you made, Council Forgy and Council Terenzo. I just wanted to point out, um, the, just sparring, that we are increasing greatly the amount that goes in here. We've done 25,000, 25,000, 50,000. And this time, there are things that need to be settled, and we're going to be increasing in amount to a fund, perhaps. Okay, depending on how that vote comes out. So my point is, sometimes things change. And I can see what Councillor Toronto said, because there are things that need to be paid. And my point on a previous one was that sometimes funds that go into a different fund are can be adjusted as life changes. That's all. I'll be silent now. I'm sure you'll all be glad about that. We will, we will have, I think, a vigorous conversation tomorrow evening on council floor. Uh, Councillor Golub, does, is this helpful to you at all? Do you have any follow-up? I'm good right now and I appreciate your explanation. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so if uh, if everybody is comfortable, we're going to move on to item six, which is discussion. I have a very limited report for the Capital Improvement Committee. They will be meeting this Friday um, at 11 o'clock. It's going to be a hybrid meeting. And um, we have, I believe, four um, or possibly five different departments that we will be speaking to based on their needs, which is on the capital improvement schedule on the five-year plan. Um, we have nothing really to review for the Greenfield's budget process. Any other business? Uh, Councilor DeSorga. Uh, uh, two things on the last two topics. Um, sure. thank, you, thank you for serving on that capital committee. Um, when, and I'll try to watch those. Um, I would be very curious on uh, the amount spent and actual bills and reports on for things that we approved last year for capital. Okay. And as we go on and are looking at the budget, and I'm saying this early, we said it last year, but I just want to say this again, because I know that all of you who are working on finance will be doing this. I think it would be extremely helpful for um, us, it, whoever's going to be on Ways and Means, to have, when we do the budgets, the number of staff per department, part-time, full-time, like if it's a 0.4, I used to do scheduling, it's 0.4, what they have this year and what they had the last year. Um, the department heads will know how many employees they have. It would be something that if it were in the budget book would be extraordinarily helpful to us. And that's all I have for tonight. Okay, those are very good comments and I appreciate them and I sure others do as well. If there's no new business, then I will say that we are scheduled <laughs> for our next meeting, which is December 20th, 6 p.m. via Zoom, unless we are otherwise posted. Can't believe it'll be the end of the year. Um, I need a motion to adjourn. So move to Sorger. Thank you. Second? Yeah, got that. Second. Uh, Taranto? Yeah, that's me. All in that's favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you all. Good night. Have a good, have a good evening and I'll see you tomorrow night.